This is a brief video on premature rupture of membranes or the leakage of amniotic fluid before labor during pregnancy. We're going to be talking about an overview of premature rupture of membranes or PROM. We're going to be talking about risk factors and causes of PROM. We're going to talk about how to diagnose it and some tests that you can use to diagnose it. We're going to talk about the management of premature rupture of membranes based on the age, the gestational age of the fetus, and we're going to talk about one complication of premature rupture, which is chorioamnionitis. Before we begin, this is a picture of a 10-week-old human fetus, and you can see that it is surrounded by the amniotic fluid and fetal membranes. And if those fetal membranes were to rupture, that would be called premature rupture of membranes. Let's get started with an overview. There are a few acronyms that are worth keeping straight, lots of P's, and the P's uh, mean different things in different acronyms. So first, PROM, as we said, is premature rupture of membranes. That's defined as a rupture of the amniotic sac with fluid spillage more than one hour before the onset of labor. So when that amniotic sac that we saw in the previous picture ruptures and fluid spills one hour before the contractions, the regular contractions begin that define labor, the regular contractions and the cervical changes. So again, the definition of labor is regular contractions and cervical changes. When the sac ruptures more than one hour before that definition of labor, you have PROM, premature rupture of membranes. PPROM, or PPROM, is preterm premature rupture of membranes. Different P's here. This is amniotic sac rupture before 37 weeks. There's also prolonged rupture of membranes, which doesn't have an acronym, but it's another P. This is amniotic sac rupture for longer than 18 hours before delivery. So if you have premature rupture of membranes more than 20 hours below, before delivery, that would be premature rupture of membranes and prolonged rupture of membranes. When describing PROM, premature rupture of membranes, it's important to describe or hear the patient describe what they saw, what they felt, what they experienced when they thought that they ruptured their membranes. Some patients describe it as a gush of fluid. Um, it can also be described as a steady leakage of fluid, depending on how much fluid actually got out of the sac when the membranes ruptured. Other things to note are the color and the consistency of the fluid that came out. And this can <clears throat> be a description like a thick versus watery fluid. You can also describe the fluid as clear, cloudy, meconium stained, or blood tinged. Um, and that would describe the color and the clarity of the fluid. There are some risk factors for PROM. We're going to be listing those here. Some of these are also causes. Vaginal and cervical infections like UTIs, STIs, and bacterial vaginosis can precipitate premature rupture of membranes. Smoking or drug use during pregnancy can precipitate premature rupture of membranes. Premature rupture of membranes or preterm deliveries in the past, so a history of PROM, means that you're more likely to have premature rupture of membranes. Nutritional deficiencies, like not taking your prenatal vitamins, as well as underweight mothers, moms that are too thin, not able to support a uh, baby and the membranes. Polyhydramnios, or too much amniotic fluid, can essentially pop the balloon that is the amniotic membranes. Multiple gestations, there's not enough room in the uterus to handle two or more babies, so that puts you at risk for premature rupture. Cervical insufficiency, like having a short or a prematurely dilated cervix, can put you at risk for premature rupture. Invasive procedures, such as amniocentesis or a cerclage placement, can put you at risk. Pathophysiology of premature rupture membranes is essentially that the fetal membranes are weak, that there's damage to the membranes, sometimes in the form of infections. And it's important to know that sometimes these, these infections aren't overt fever inducing infections. Sometimes they're subclinical with no symptoms, with no burning, with urination, with no itching. Um, they could be subclinical infections. And there are some genetic factors, of course. To diagnose premature rupture of membranes, there are three classic tests. <clears throat> and some people say that you need two of these three tests. Anyway, the three tests are pooling, which is a collection of fluid in the vagina, um, specifically in the posterior fornix of the vagina, usually seen on speculum exam. There's a nitrazine test, which is a chemical that turns blue when exposed to neutral fluids, fluids of neutral pH. Um, this is because the vaginal fluid is usually acidic and amniotic fluid is mildly acidic. 
um, excuse me, mildly basic, I should say. And if the amniotic fluid mixes with the, with the vaginal fluid, the net solution is going to be more neutral. Therefore, the nitrosine paper will turn blue. There are a couple things that cause false positives on the nitrosine test. This includes blood, semen, infections, antiseptics, and lubricants. So if you're putting in a speculum to check for vaginal pooling, you want to make sure not to put any gel on that speculum because that lubricant can give you a false positive for the nitrosine test. If the cervix is bleeding, the nitrosine test might not be accurate because the blood from the cervix can change the results of that nitrosine test. Ferning is another test where you see dry amniotic fluid on a glass slide under the microscope. Um, when, that, when that amniotic fluid dries on that slide, it sometimes has a crystallization pattern called arborization, and this resembles a fern plant. Um, we'll show a picture of ferning in the next slide. A couple other tests that can be used to help diagnose premature rupture. Ultrasound can detect low fluid levels, uh, might look like oligohydramnios, um, and this is the low residual fluid after the leakage of fluid, after that gush of water, whatever fluid, le whatever fluid is left will look like low fluid levels on ultrasound. There's another new test, a couple other PROM tests that detect chemicals or proteins that are specific to the amniotic fluid. So testing the fluid with these chemical tests will allow you to identify premature rupture. This is an example of ferning looked at under the microscope. And as we said, the dry amniotic fluid on the glass slide has a crystallization pattern called arborization. And this kind of looks like a fern plant when you look at it under the microscope. As for the management of premature rupture of membranes, that depends on the gestational age, as you see in that second column there. In the pre-viable infant, that is an infant less than 49 weeks in gestational age, your management is essentially watchful waiting. You don't want to use tocolytics, you don't want to use steroids, no magnesium, and no antibiotics. You might just do an induction of labor to end the pregnancy, and that could be followed by a DNE, a dilation and evacuation, um, essentially a spontaneous abortion um, if the amniotic sac were to break. In the preterm infant, that's 26 to 33 weeks, you can use tocolytics to prevent labor. Steroids need to be given twice, and they need to be given 24 hours apart, and that's to promote lung maturity. You can also give magnesium sulfate as a tocolytic. While the lungs mature, you do want to get those two doses of steroids in before the contractions really help. So if you give magnesium, that can stop the contractions while the lungs mature. And you might want to give antibiotics uh, to prevent infection of the mother, and also for group B strep prevention if the baby will be de delivered vaginally. You can prevent group B strep infection of the baby. Another option that's a little more controversial is amnio inf infusion, and that essentially puts back normal saline into the amniotic sac, essentially replacing the lost fluid uh, during the leakage. In the late preterm stage, that's 30, 34 to 36 weeks, your management would be to induce labors, and you also want to give antibiotics for GBS prevention at this stage. And in term infants, again, uh, similar management to late preterm, that's over 37 weeks, uh, your instructions would be to induce labor. There's little reason not to. Again, antibiotics for group B strep prevention. Now, one complication of premature rupture of membranes is chorioamnionitis. This is, by definition, an infection of the chorion and amnion, which are the two membranes, as well as the amniotic fluid surrounding the fetus. So if some bacteria, if some fungus gets into this area, it can become infected. It's obviously very nutritional fluid, and that causes choreo. This is diagnosed with some signs and symptoms on physical exam. This includes fever, like any other infection in the body can cause, uh, rupture of membranes, of course, leakage of fluid, following rupture of membranes, uterine tenderness, elevated maternal heart rate, that's a maternal heart rate over 100 beats per minute, and an elevated fetal heart rate, that's a heart rate over 160 beats per minute in the fetus. If there is a fever, you do want to rule out a UTI in the mom or a URI in the mom. You do want to rule out other causes of maternal fever. Some lab values that help you diagnose choreo are increased white count, that's over 15,000 cells. Um, again, that uh, white count, what is normal for white count changes in pregnancy. So increased white count above 15,000 or 16,000 would be more concerning for choreo. In patients with choreo, you treat with ampicillin, gentamicin, and clindamycin. A patient that you suspect has choreo amyonitis uh, will also warrant a delivery. So delivery is usually induced with oxytocin. 
You specifically want to treat with ampicillin, gentamicin, and clindamycin to cover for gram negatives and anaerobe organisms that might be present in the vaginal flora that might have caused the choreo. And lastly, you do want to make sure that patients with choreo are afebrile for 24 hours before discharge to ensure that the infection has not spread and does not continue to persist. In this image that we see on the right here, you can see some of the inflammatory cells um, in the membranes on pathology. This has been a brief video on premature rupture of membranes and the sequela of choreo. I hope this was helpful and thank you for listening.